started. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along to this evening's webinar. My name's Sophie, and I'm the Professional Development Manager at English Australia. I've got the pleasure this evening of introducing our presenter, Judith Cormus. Judith is the Director of Studies for the Master of TESOL Distance Program at Lancaster University. She offers a master's module on teaching languages to students with special learning difficulties. And she also offers a free online learning course on dyslexia and language learning through FutureLearn and Lancaster University. So we're really delighted to have you here presenting for us tonight, Judith. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I also wanted to let people know that this webinar is actually the second webinar in a series that English Australia has delivered on learning differences. Um, part one of this series, which was about identifying learning differences, was run about a month ago, and you can listen to the recording of part one if you click on the link on your screen. I'll pop it into the chat as well. So part one was presented by Varinda Anlu, a different presenter, um, and part two this evening by Judith. So thanks, Judith. I'll hand over to you now. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure and, and honor. And I said this is my first time ever to talk, uh, talking in real life or virtual life to, Austrian, to an Australian, Australian and New Zealand audience. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for being devoted to stay up so late. Um, and um, let me just start by um, sharing my, my screen. This, um, this is, we won't start with the questions and comments, but we'll start from the beginning. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking for about 40 to, um, um, to, to 50 minutes. Um, feel free to, um, to, um, to ask questions in the, in the chat. At the moment, I can't see the chat when I'm in, in full screen. Um, I might uh, actually switch um, to the smaller screen um, it's time to time to see if you have any questions in the in the chat or or I might ask you to pop some ideas into the chat. So my my uh, talk follows on from um, the previous session, which is uh, which was about identifying uh, learning difficulties. And, and I'm mostly going to be discussing inclusive practices for learning um, differences. And before we start. Um, going into detail about specific teaching techniques and methods, it is just important to remind us of the difference between integration and inclusive education. Um, integration is um, the approach to education of people who have specific needs when um, it, the, it is the responsibility of the individual to accommodate to the characteristics and demands of this institution, the learning context, et cetera. Uh, whereas in inclusive education, it is the institutions, the teachers, the schools, the, um, um, the educational managers responsibility to adapt to the students' needs. And, uh, and this needs to be kind of an, a proactive uh, adaptation as well to anticipate uh, the needs of students. Um, but also it needs to be a reactive adaptation when you see that the students are struggling, they have specific weaknesses that you think may need to be addressed, then you need to adapt your, your teaching as, as you go along. Um, so that's um, the approach we are going to uh, discuss. And, and it's also important to point out that inclusion is not a product, it's not a final stage, it's a process. Um, it's a never ending process and we'll, we'll, we'll have to work constantly towards being more and more inclusive and react more proactively to the needs of our students and probably full inclusion will never be possible, but we, uh, but we need to kind of aim for, for making our uh, teaching as inclusive as, as possible. So um, just to um, give you an outline of what um, I think the key principles of inclusive education are. The first one, and this, is, this has been covered in the previous webinar, I'll quickly perhaps run through a couple of slides for you to, to get some of the background if you haven't uh, attended the previous session so that you understand why we are adapting some of these inclusive, inclusive techniques. 
Um, the first one is really to recognize that, there are, that some of our students do have learning differences, learning difficulties, um, specific needs, specific strengths and weaknesses. And then once we have um, recognized these um, needs, uh, we also need to understand what, what these needs are, how, how, um, how do they affect uh, learning? Because only after that can we adapt um, our teaching. Then uh, we uh, can um, provide um, a, an educational design uh, which is universal in nature and allows accessibility to the widest possible extent and to the largest possible group of our students, no matter their individual characteristics. Universal design, of course, is not a foolproof um, uh, strategy. Um, you can always, you will always have to make certain adjustments and accommodations, and we'll talk about uh, what these are. And then uh, I also believe that um, in order to be inclusive and in order to support students who do have some learning challenges, we need to um, um, uh, make them aware of the importance and use of learning strategies, self-regulation strategies, and then also to apply certain teaching techniques, which are helpful for everybody, uh, but they are particularly useful for students who have um, learning difficulties. So for recognizing and, and understanding, um, what, what is important um, to remember is that there are specific cognitive causes for specific learning difficulties, and they are related to phonological processing problems, how we perceive sounds. Um, they are also related to how much information the student can keep in, in their working memory and that how much they can manipulate at a time. They might be slower processing information and they might have uh, difficulties regulating their, their attention. And this has an impact on second language learning. And this impact is uh, much wider ranging than we usually think. Uh, for example, when we think about dyslexia, it's not just about reading and writing and spelling. It's also about remembering information through listening, accuracy and cohesion in speaking, also in writing, and, and also um, difficulties remembering vocabulary. Um, there are effective aspects of specific learning difficulties related, you know, the students with SBRDs then might be quite anxious due to their learning difficulties, their negative learning experiences. Um, they might have um, low self-esteem and self-confidence. They might lose their motivation um, to learn another language, and this is all we need. These are all things we need to address. And then, if students with uh, autistic spectrum disorder, um, they might also have some challenges um, empathizing with their colleagues, with the with their teachers. Um, there are also social aspects uh, of SPLDs. Uh, relating to social challenges with social communication, taking perspective, how does the other person think, collaboration and cooperation, following rules and, and norms that again, we will have to consider and, and address. And of course, we need to remember that um, there are strengths uh, related to, to SPLDs as, as well, um, such as originality, creativity, uh, etc. So um, I hope this was a, a useful um, a recap um, of, um, um, of, um, of, of what you have uh, covered uh, in the previous uh, session. And let us start with, uh, with the concept of universal design, um, which is an important um, new education. Okay, Amy, uh, you have a question. Let me, let me see if I, if I go. Um, uh, how do I see the chat? One moment. Uh, why can't I just say chat? Okay, uh, Amy, did you put 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 it? Um, um, can you put your question in the in the chat? Um, I don't know if it's a general thing with how the presentation is going, or if you have specific questions. Um, I can't see anything in the chat right now, so uh, I, I I'll move on. Um, let me try to see if. Okay, now I can see the chat as well. Um, so Amy, if you have a question, please um, let me know. Okay, on universal design overview of main um, uh, principles. Um, it is um, universal design is now um, a very widely used educational concept. 
And it has three main principles. And for us as language teachers, I think that the, the first main principle that we need to consider is that uh, it is very important to give learners different opportunities and choices for how they access information. For example, visually or in reading or orally as in listening or a combination of the two. And, and nowadays when there are actually accessibility guidelines, for example, in the UK for all the materials, this is becoming common practice. But a couple of years ago, um, this, this wasn't so well known or so widely required of educational materials. Um, the other um, um, main um, uh, principle of universal design is not only to give students options for how they receive information, but also how they produce language, how they produce outputs, how they are assessed. Um, and if possible, we should give students choices to, to express themselves. Uh, maybe they can choose between writing and speaking, um, choosing between sometimes physical action and, um, and writing and speaking. I know that this is not always possible because um, writing and speaking in second language um, learning and in assessment, they are not interchangeable skills and we can't neglect one skill at the expense of the other. And we can't say that, oh, students with dyslexia have challenges with writing, so we should completely waive them from the writing requirement because that um, will put them at a disadvantage. But where possible, we can consider for particular types of tasks, do they need to write or could, we, could they perhaps record themselves speaking? Um, and the third principle, I think it's probably quite obvious to anyone who is in the language teaching profession that we should use different ways of engaging our students, motivating them, etc. So I'm not going to spend more time on these main principles, but it should be important to, to keep them in mind. And um, what I'm, um, I would like to show you here is one option for a task design that we have developed in a, in a project. This is for, for younger students um, who, had, um, who have dyslexia, but it gives you an example of how you can build in options into your task design um, that um, some students can, can write a message some students can, can record it uh, with, uh, with their phones. Um, another example I wanted to give you uh, for um, graduated level of support, which is also an, an important aspect of universal design, particularly when it comes to the productive skills such as writing and speaking. Um, that, that you can you give different supportive tools to the students within one task, like a differentiated level of, 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 um, of, uh, of support or scaffolding. And students can make use of this support. Students who, who are struggling, they can use the frame, the written frame, they can use the listening text. And students who don't need it, they can do it just autonomously uh, without the support. Um, so again, that uh, might be important to consider uh, when you design tasks. Um, when we talk about universal design, we really shouldn't forget that um, a lot of our teaching now is digitally mediated, it's, it's online. And, uh, and students with specific learning difficulties um, do have um, challenges uh, with online learning digital materials, but there are also advantages of online uh, learning for these uh, uh, students, particularly because um, a lot of these universal design or, or accessibility principles are built into uh, online education. And, and one of the advantages um, or some of the advantages of, um, of online learning is that there is more, a bit more flexibility with timing and tasks, uh, especially if you use a blended approach. Um, there are more assistive tools available immediately as, um, as students are following an online class, you can switch on the subtitling function, et cetera. Uh, a lot of the times uh, you use more project-based learning uh, when learning is, is online. Um, tests um, 
or at least classroom tests are being transformed. Um, the, you know, the standard vocabulary quizzes when students put away all their resources and you quiz them in class, they, 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 they are not meaningful in online context. So there are alternative assessment uh, formats, which again are more advantageous for, for these students. And for students who might have challenges with autism spectrum disorders, there are perhaps fewer demands on social interaction in the sense that you're not in the room with 10, 15 different people with lots of noise around you and lots of buzz and interaction that, that can be really challenging for these students. But there are also disadvantages, um, such as sometimes the learning environment is less structured, there is model, there is different learning uh, tasks uh, happening at different times of the week. Um, there is lower level of teacher control. You're, you're not there uh, watching over the students' shoulders um, in, in an online class as, as you are maybe in a face-to-face in a, in a -face classroom. And the students need a higher level of autonomy and self-regulation. There is longer screen time and uh, also fewer social clues on screen. So for example, just for me giving this talk, it's really, really difficult, you know, not seeing you, not seeing how you follow on, uh, whether I should speed up, I should slow down, uh, whether you find this interesting, um, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's, it's quite challenging. So what can we do to support these students? Um, when, when you start with students, um, nowadays maybe it's obvious, maybe now all students know how uh, each platform works, but you may not um, take it for granted. Maybe students use different online platforms. And, and even though we have a digital generation, um, you, you will be, or you probably have been surprised that students still can't use certain functionalities of the online tools that, that you are using. Um, students need, need time to adjust to, to the specific characteristics of the online environment. And those with SPLEs, they might need more time. Um, and, um, and I think it, because we will be talking about learning strategies and self-regulation, it is really important to, to talk about how to learn alone, how to be an autonomous um, a student and, and spend time on that. Um, a lot of the students are still not aware of the, of the existence of some of the assistive devices, such as, for example, Microsoft Word has an inbuilt uh, readout function that you can switch on um, subtitles, on PowerPoint presentations, that there are day planners, etc. So again, spending a bit of time benefits everyone, not just those who have specific learning difficulties. And of course, it may not be possible in all contexts, but, but if you know that some of your students might have specific learning difficulties, it is very useful to have a one-to-one -one meeting and discuss how you could support them in the online learning environment. Um, or if you notice they are having challenges, uh, what, what are these challenges and what changes can you make to your teaching to, to accommodate these students better? Um, peer, you can assign peer mentors who, who help um, these students. Um, and just some small tips. Um, again, this benefits uh, everybody. But we tend to give, even in online instruction, we tend to give longer instructions. Um, some of our task descriptions on, on Moodle platforms can, can, might be quite long and students might forget about the steps. So it's really useful to break down tasks into smaller tab, uh, steps and then stagger the instruction, giving one part of the instruction first. They do one part of the task and then they get the next, in, uh, next uh, instruction. Um, adjusting the task to the student's attention span um, is, is, is useful. Of course, you can't always do it in a, in, a, in a class that has a large number of students, but bear it in mind that sitting in front of the computer and doing tasks it might be even more challenging than doing it in a classroom uh, context. And there are uh, techniques um, that students can use to kind of train their, their attention and not to be too distracted, like the Pomodoro technique, which uh, is the, you know, the kind of kitchen timer, which looks like a tomato. And you can, you can set it and you say, okay, I'm going to learn the words for 10 minutes. Uh, and then after 10 minutes, I'm going to have a five minute break. I'll reward myself with something and then I start again. There are apps um, which help you uh, focus. I put one there, which I think is really nice. 
And if possible, you could include periods of physical activity in the online session. So uh, you can say, tell students, um, walk to the window, look outside um, and, and, and type in the chat what you can see um, so that uh, at least uh, students have a chance to, to stand up and, and, and move around. Um, Right, um, and um, and some more um, um, advice about the accessibility of online resources as um, in line with the principles of universal design. It's um, really useful to, to have multiple, multiple modes of presentation, written, video, pictures. Um, at the same time, it's important not to overload the students um, so that everything is coming from, from three different channels because then their attention will be um, divided. The best is to give options for the students to, to choose. And if you think subtitles, for example, are helpful, they can switch it on. Um, but uh, again, discuss whether what they find distracting and, and, and whatnot. Um, allowing students alternative response format um, to, uh, to tests or tasks, as I have illustrated, making sure instructions are short, concise, and uh, think about file formats, uh, which are easy to, to convert into accessible mode or which are easy to be read out. Uh, Microsoft Word, for example, is much better than a PDF. And, and giving students choices and options, uh, um, if possible, how to, how to complete them. Um, one, again, uh, tip is that uh, you can harness the students' strengths with multimedia tasks and, and uh, multimedia-based assessment. Um, we have a lot of these tools like narrated PowerPoints, videos, etc. varying plenary work with breakout rooms um, and, and interactive um, tools are, are really helpful uh, for students. So these are um, some of the elements of universal design in, um, in the digital uh, age um, that benefit everyone, but we also might have to make some adjustments. So what can we adjust in our classes? Maybe you can put uh, some of these things in the chat. So if you have specific learning students with specific learning difficulties, what, what would you adjust? What would be the five things that you would put into these bubbles here? You, if you could perhaps type them in the, in the chat. Um, a couple of ideas. More time for tasks. Thank you, Megan. Classroom layout. Okay, that's excellent. Okay, timing. Addressing students by name. That's that's very good, Sue. Copies of PPTs, environment, use of color to differentiate items. Thank you, Jennifer. That's a good idea. Differentiation of tasks and outcomes, Calvin. Yes, that's absolutely uh, fantastic. Yes, that's very important. Content, we can adjust the content. Okay, so you're actually talking about differentiation in terms of content, product, process, um, presentation mode, um, right? Improving the um, written materials, formatting. Okay, good ideas. Um, testing format. Right, okay, so let me show you what I have here, uh, font size and style. Okay, so um, a lot of these things have been mentioned. Um, classroom management, so you can adjust your classroom management, uh, allow students who have maybe Asperger syndrome or autism spectrum disorder, even work alone sometimes, or just in smaller pairs, or um, pairing students in various ways. Um, you did mention environment, um, for again, students with Asperger syndrome, um, you have to be careful that the light shouldn't be too bright, etc. Now I know a lot of you are not in real classrooms, so this is where students can adjust these for, for themselves. And um, and you mentioned the timing. That's that's really important. Uh, the the pacing because that's where the students have the biggest challenges. That um, that some of the the way we teach is just too fast for them. And often the speed is dictated by um, your um, your employer. Um, but if possible, try to represent the 
the needs of your students, we generally find that actually some of these um, milestones that students have to reach within a set number of hours in a, in a language school, in a language course, is, is just too much, uh, even for, for, um, for students who have good abilities, because, you know, the aim is to make students progress as quickly as possible, but it often really dis, uh, disadvantages students with specific learning difficulties. And then you mentioned the presentation and access to materials, and, um, and I would add the level of, of teacher support. Okay. So um, now we have probably exhausted the topic of universal design and, um, and adjustments. Um, let me talk briefly about um, uh, learning strategies and then uh, in more detail about some teaching techniques. Um, I believe that learning strategies and self-regulation of learning and, and teaching students how to regulate their own learning is really key. Um, to, to success uh, with students who have specific learning difficulties. And I think we need to kind of um, consider four stages. One is planning the learning process. What, when, uh, where, and how students are going to learn. And again, you often think that you work with adults, you work with people who have been through um, education, um, um, maybe 10, 15 years of their life, but they may still not be very efficient planners of their learning process. So it's really worth spending the time on this. Regulating attention, I mentioned it earlier, teaching students to, to focus and, and, and make good use of their time um, is again very important, especially for those who have attention uh, issues. Um, then, um, if you remember, I talked about um, issues with self-esteem and self-confidence. Um, regulating feelings and motivation, again, is key to success uh, for these students. And you can, you can teach students to visualize success, to imagine what they can do with the language, imagine when they have reached that IELTS level and they can study in Australia and then and what it is in, in Australia that, that they would like to, to, to see. Um, like it's, for example, if, if I were a language language learner, it's really my dream to once see the Sydney Opera in real life. So I could definitely be motivated by visualizing this, my, visualizing myself seeing it. Um, by reaching that goal, um, rewarding success. So actually recognizing if a student is successful in certain things, they have written a good essay, they have managed to learn 10 words with relatively few mistakes, then how do you reward yourself for the success? And who, how do you acknowledge that, yes, I, I have been successful. If your self-esteem is low, you really have to find ways of rewarding and recognizing uh, your success and accepting that mistakes and failure are part of the learning process. And we all make mistakes um, and, and they are acceptable and, um, and, um, and they are just natural um, and they are not things we should be ashamed of. And, um, and another aspect of self-regulation is self-evaluation. What I have found is that um, students with specific learning difficulties might um, sometimes overestimate how much um, they know. And you ask them to learn 10 words, and they, they spend five minutes on it and they think, okay, I know these 10 words um, and, and, and they don't. Um, so you have to teach them how to test um, themselves. How you, can you measure that you know? How can you uh, assess that your essay is completed and it's not just the first draft, but you know, put it aside, go back, revise, etc. cetera. And, um, and it, in that regard, learning diaries or learning journals are again, um, quite um, helpful. Um, so these were the um, oops um, um, the uh, learning strategies. Maybe I go back um, um, for one second and ask you if you have any other self-regulation or uh, strategies that um, general self-regulation strategies that you use in your teaching. You can put it in the in the box uh, to to share with the with the others, or you can say whether you actually spent uh, time on these issues in your in your classroom at the be beginning of the course or perhaps once the course started and you see that students are, are struggling. So if you wish you can you can put it in the chat. Um, any additional 
self-regulation ideas or whether you have little checklists. Yes, that's very good. Um, checklists, you know, if you have weekly units, checklists, have you done all the homework? That's a great idea. Um, if you have any other ideas or whether you do this in your teaching, um, you can put it in the box. Okay, and in the meantime, I just move on. And when we discussed um, this talk with Sophie, she said, you know, I should really focus on reading and, um, 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 and, and, and writing. Um, but I thought I just very quickly uh, show you one resource, even though you probably work with higher level learners, um, some, some of the, um, these lower level skills, such as spelling and pronunciation, are really foundations to future learning success. And because students with specific learning difficulties do have challenges in, um, in these areas, um, you might consider, particularly if you are working with lower level learners, um, that building in some orthographic and phonological awareness training and training in, um, in word recognition um, into your teaching and the explicit teaching of, um, of uh, spelling and phonological regularities because English is not as irregular as it would seem at the first sight. So I just put in one resource for you. This has been primarily designed for, for children aged between four, 10 and, and, uh, and 14 learning English, but a lot of this is really useful for, for everyone. So um, uh, even older students, um, and these are examples of how you might want to develop phonological awareness and spelling skills. So that's just be, keep it in mind that sometimes even with high level learners, if their spelling, if, if their spelling is, is um, much worse than their other you know, higher level writing processes, then you might want to go back to some of this lower level um, training. Okay, um, when, one specific area, again, um, uh, vocabulary, um, I won't talk too much about vocabulary learning, but vocabulary is, is again a foundational skill um, or foundational knowledge for reading and writing success. And students with specific um, learning difficulties, they do have challenges with vocabulary learning. And these challenges, they persist over time. So even though they reach B1, B2, maybe even C1 level, they do struggle with vocabulary. And even the successful students, if you ask them, they would say that, you know, they, they are struggling. And some of them, they, if they reach that level, they might have some quite successful strategies um, to deal with those. But if you work with lower level learners, they may not have them. So again, if it's, it's really useful to consider vocabulary learning strategies and spending time with students on how to learn vocabulary. And I put a couple of, of uh, questions that you can use. Um, I often show students, I ask them, I'm Hungarian, my first language is Hungarian. I give students 10 random Hungarian words to learn with their English meanings. And then you know we discuss what strategies they used, how they work, whether the strategy depends on the type of the words. Is there anything that makes the work uh, word sets more words or the word sets more uh, difficult um, to learn? And then they can um, apply this in their. Um, in their own uh, learning. And, and some um, techniques that you can use, um, even with advanced learners, are drawing things, acting out, apps, um, mnemonics, how do you spell because? Um, big elephants can always understand small elephants. Um, so these kinds of strategies, um, using keywords, you know, how associating um, certain words um, uh, with, with another. Um, chunking, um, breaking up words into, into parts and rhyme and songs and, and rhythm. And I just put a, like a drawing that my uh, children <laughs> used to, to draw how to remember um, spelling of difficult words like window has two W's, like two window panes, et cetera. Okay, so um, we talked a little bit about foundational skills. Um, let's move on to um, to reading strategies and what we can do to help students with reading, particularly if you prepare them for, for tests like IELTS, which has a really tricky um, reading assessment, texts being quite long and, um, and the time given is relatively short. Um, 
so what we can really work with students uh, on their um, top level reading strategies, helping them to, to, um, to make predictions about what is going to come, what, what information they can activate um, and, and how, how they can visualize um, the text. Um, because if your reading speed is slow and if you might read inaccurately, then if you have a background knowledge, then you know that if the text um, is about um, 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 geography, then if you see a word, maybe, you know, th the text is about geography and, and, and you misread hill for, let's say, hell, then you probably know that this, is, this doesn't fit because the text is about um, mountains and hills, etc. And, and also teaching students to monitor their comprehension. The, you read a part of the text and then you question yourself. Okay, this is the understanding I got. Uh, is it correct? Does it match uh, what went on in the text before? Does it match what is coming in the subheading next? So um, again, students with dyslexia may not be so good with monitoring their comprehension. They think they understand, but actually they don't. Um, encouraging students to reread and go back and revisit certain parts of the text that they haven't understood um, can be helpful. Another strategy that many dyslexic students or students with specific learning difficulties um, report that they find useful is sub-vocal reading, which is reading by just slightly moving your mouth and, and almost kind of pronouncing the words, but not, not pronouncing them in, in, in real life. That helps students to keep on track and they actually kind of mentally hear what they are reading and that helps them understand better and, and notice if they misread things. Um, reading while listening can be uh, quite helpful and um, annotating texts um, in different ways with highlighting notes, charts, um, mind maps and concept maps, drawing visual representation of a, of a longer text helps them see the, the structure of the text and the, and the logical links, uh, especially if it's a longer um, technical or, or academic text. So just to give you an idea, here, this is um, like uh, one um, 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 kind of concept map where um, um, if students read a text about better access for people with disabilities and the text will deal with public services, um, education and jobs, then you can use this as a prediction uh, task. What would be the ideas that you would put? But you can also use this as a, as a task to, to check their comprehension. Can they put the, the six ideas onto the, into the bubbles um, uh, and link them to the, to the appropriate main idea? Or this is another um, um, uh, way of, of kind of brainstorming before the students read or, or, uh, and, and activating their background knowledge, but also checking that they understood the text by asking these um, questions like, what, what is the main point of this article? Who are these people? Um, where and when should we ensure access, et cetera? So these, these um, um, can activate the student's background knowledge as well as they can use it to fill in um, information and helps them get, get an overview. And, and then you can teach them to use these um, 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 mind maps or concept maps and draw them quickly uh, for um, in academic um, um, preparation courses when, when you prepare them for, for reading longer academic texts. Um, I wanted to show you one interesting um, aspect of um, developing students' reading skills. We, I have been working on a project where we used comics um, for reading skills and, uh, and to support students with their, writings, um, uh, with their writing skills. Um, particularly for, for the types of exams, for example, that you might be preparing students for, like, um, like um, uh, IELTS, where you have um, a prompt like the one you can see in the screen, like, um, do you disagree or agree with, uh, um, um, with how we can re uh, reduce inequality in, uh, for, for people with, uh, with disabilities? And I, I will just show you some of the, the, the pains of the comics we have designed. 
So these are quite different from the types of comics that uh, um, you might um, want to see. Anna, you can pop your question in the chat box. Um, I can see you raise your hand. I hope everyone can still hear me and follow me. Um, these are some of this. This is how the text uh, continues, right? And um, and this is again how 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 the text uh, goes. And there is a whole um, um, uh, cartoon uh, about it. And and I you know recommend that you might actually check out some of some of these um, resources um, because uh, comics are really great educational tools. Um, they can be fun, engaging, motivating, they are multimodal, and, and they are really kind of bridging the gap between different media that we watch and, and that we that we read. And, and some of these comics are great examples of how you can actually illustrate um, the um, uh, really difficult academic content um, to students. Um, and, um, and comics are useful for students to develop their um, 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 their uh, comprehension and information processing skills. Because as you were reading, um, you probably noticed that you have to be a much more active participant in the reading process because there is the picture and then the text, often the sentence is broken up between two panes and you have to connect it. And it's not like your, your eyes are going text, 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 and then you, you miss um, certain parts, but you really have to you know, watch and, and, and follow and you can't really skip things. Um, and you need imagination um, to combine the panels and the visuals. And this is, again, enhances comprehension. You're reading much more carefully and you can understand uh, more difficult um, concepts and then the visuals help you recall information. And then visual literacy. I mean, our I think our um, literacy concept, this multimodal literacy is, is changing. We're not, I, I think in the next 10 years, we will probably be testing a much wider range of reading skills, not just a, a printed um, text on a, on a page. Um, so this, this was just some ideas that you can actually use comics for, for reading. Um, and I have a couple of other uh, suggestions for developing um, reading skills. Um, and, and these are some collaborative um, uh, activities. Um, uh, one of them is the reciprocal um, teaching method where students work in groups with a, with a text and they read section by section and students are given different roles, like a summarizer role who highlights the key ideas, a questioner who asked a question about uh, a section, things that were unclear, um, the clarifier can answer these questions and the predictor makes predictions about what comes next. And you can do this also online. And this can support students who have reading challenges and you can assign different rules, roles um, to the students. So maybe the student who has challenges, they can be the questioner or they can be the predictor because they have really good imagination. They have good prediction skills. And then a, a stronger student can be the clarifier who supports the others. And the other uh, collaborative um, reading um, um, support uh, activity is the directed reading thinking activity. There are some similarities between these two approaches. Um, again, students um, work uh, with sections of the text and they, they, they work in groups. They start reading by making predictions about what the text segment will be about. Then they read the relevant part of the text to check their predictions. And then they discuss to what extent the predictions were confirmed, summarize the key information from the text segment, and then they repeat it after each segment. And I think this is particularly useful if you use, introduce a new um, genre of academic text or, or, or a complex text, or if, if you work, for example, with, um, with literary texts, but also if, if you use some scientific texts as well. Um, so writing um, tips, again, these are, writing can be challenging for students who have 
um, specific um, difficulties. And in general, um, one tip is that the more vocabulary you know productively, and the more you read certain types of genres that you need to produce, the better your writing um, will be. But there are ways in which we can support students with um, uh, specific learning difficulties. But in general, um, students uh, are in their writing. Um, again, I, I think you know a lot of what I'm going to suggest is part of your standard repertoire of teaching writing. But when, when you work with students with specific learning difficulties, you really have to pay attention that you include some of these process writing approaches to support the students uh, with planning such as brainstorming or creating mind maps. Some st dyslexic students really like the not necessarily a hierarchical structure, but a but a mind map so that they can see the the whole um, outline. Um, multi sensory planning activities um, by organizing ideas according to colors or shapes, and then manipulating them and and moving them and cutting up their own text perhaps and moving things around. Um, with, a, with a more hands-on approach, especially if you manage to get back into the physical classroom, that, that can be quite um, uh, useful for these students. Um, I mentioned earlier that, um, that writing can be quite a daunting task for students with specific learning difficulties. It, um, it can take a lot of time, a lot of commitment, engagement. So if you can cut it up into smaller subtasks, asking students maybe to produce just one body paragraph at a time, then the next body paragraph, and then, then the conclusion, and then finally the introduction, so that it's not just one, one huge piece of 1,000 word essay, or I don't know, 5,000 word essay at a, at a time. Um, time, enough time for writing. Um, it's really important to consider how much time our students will need for writing um, and, and students with specific learning difficulties probably need around 50% more than our average student. So when you assess their writing skills, giving them more time is really important. And when you plan assignments, again, make sure that students can complete them because maybe they can do it well, but they just need more time for it. Um, Again, we, it was mentioned before, but um, um, encouraging students to use um, aids and, and teaching them how to use them, various online dictionaries, spell checkers, lots of you know, uh, online thesauruses. Um, there are lots of online resources that can help students. And often, you know, we are surprised that they are not aware of them. You mentioned checklists um, uh, already um, in your, uh, in your um, chat boxes, in the, in the chat box that, um, that uh, we shared. Um, but checklists that you draw up for students to guide how they should like and, and assist in self-evaluation are, again, very useful. Um, and setting specific linguistic focus for the writing task um, can uh, make students aware that let's say you're focusing on the past simple, you're teaching them story writing, then it doesn't matter if you have a lot of spelling mistakes, but make sure you get the past simple right in, the, in this story. Or, um, or if you were writing an argumentative text, uh, maybe don't worry so much about tenses, but make sure your, your connective devices um, are, are used correctly and, and, and sufficiently. In, in the text. So um, because asking the students to pay attention to everything at the same time can overload their attentional resources. So one thing at a time, or you can you know, give them step by step. OK, read your story. Now check your past use of the past simple. Now check, did you use cohesive devices? Did you signal the timeline transitions um, appropriately? So, so these things um, um, do help the students to improve their writing. And, and sharing and making the, the writing process kind of pur purposeful um, because you know we tend to write for an audience and and often our <laughs> writing task that we set our students is just writing for the sake of writing and that's not very motivating and there are lots of collaborative writing tools uh, where students can write together and and they do enjoy it and they support each other. So um, I just wanted to show you again um, that you can actually also use comics. You can give students the comic that I have shown you uh, and with the empty speech bubbles, and you can also 
ask them to to fill it in and it can spark interest in in writing it helps organizations do storyboarding and it can develop creative and higher level thought processes so you might want to try that out um, to develop students um, writing skills um, and their multimodal um, literacy and again i'd like to show you one thing from um, our um, uh, app or our, our project uh, we also created kind of outlines for the basic essay structure because very often we need to teach our students what is the structure of this particular genre uh, of writing and um, and some of these visual tools um, help students uh, to understand that and, and we also have like kind of um, tasks where students can um, um, put the different um, paragraphs in order or the different closing um, sentences um, in order. We use different color coding for the body, for the uh, conclusion, etc. So um, again, it's a multimodal way of illustrating writing structure um, for our students. So. Um, I, I hope that um, this talk has given you some ideas how we can support um, students with uh, specific learning difficulties to, to achieve um, success. Um, and, um, and I'm going to share some uh, resources with you um, that uh, are available, including our Future Learn course, um, some of um, the, the books that we have written, some other materials, and, and I'm really looking forward to, to your questions now. So, questions and comments. And I think I stopped sharing so that I can see the, the Q&A better. Yes. Um, I can see one question. If I am, I, I don't know if the, if it's Agi uh, as the Hungarian pronunciation is uh, would go. Um, yes, um, the, the it's the CL project. And um, one moment, and I'll put it in the um, uh, chat box um, in a moment. Let me see how I can. Uh, what what happened uh, with the uh the questions i can't see them uh sophie i can't see the questions uh anymore it says no open questions or the question disappeared okay uh right anyway i put it in the chat box um uh aggie for you to to see and for everybody to um to see, okay, and easy to use software to create comics. Where um, there are some comics creation softwares, I'm not that an expert on this. You might want to to look online. Um, our our comics were created by a professional um, uh, designer, um, and um, but we have empty kind of PDF frames that you can download and uh, and students fill it in. So that's, um, I hope that answers your question, Nasser. All right, Andrew, um, question about students uh, with SPLDs are more creative than learners who don't have an SPLD. This is a tricky question because um, there is no kind of conclusive evidence um, about, um, um, about increased creativity in students with SPLDs in certain areas, particularly in visual um, creativity, there is some research which shows that they are above average, um, but um, but the, the research itself is, is not conclusive in this regard. Some of this comes from more like experience or, or anecdotal evidence rather than exact scientific research, particularly because this issue is not so easy to investigate systematically. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question, Andrew. Oh, Deco Comics, yes, thank you. Yes, um, that's that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, I guess, I don't know, who, who, maybe so that's SIG -S 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 webinars. Is it maybe somebody from IOTEFL? Um, but the Deco Comics are, are great tools. Um, um, 
designed by by a, um, by a colleague who works with Anne Margaret Smith, um, who is another excellent um, researcher and educator in inclusive uh, education. So you might want to check out her resources on ELT. Well. Okay, Alea, how to help learners who cannot remember the things they learn, how to assist them in retaining in what they learn. So hopefully some of the techniques that I um, showed you with memorizing vocabulary um, and using image, Im 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 images um, and, and writing and, and repetition and revision, cyclical revision and recycling and testing yourself. Um, these can help students um, to, to remember um, information. So multimedia tools in, in general and, and imagining, visualizing, drawing uh, things and repeating them quite a few times um, um, hopefully help them. You have, you know, for some learners, their, their memory span will be definitely smaller, but if they revise consistently, then, then they can probably remember quite a bit. Um, Yes, Kelvin, the IELTS prep course. Um, I think um, you need to check on the um, on the provider website. They should have um, extra time um, for the IELTS test, and uh, and there is probably a specific request um, um, form uh, for for this. And um, and we did some research on on the timing of of reading tasks. And we found that students who have literacy related um, problems, they might need. So you have what we found that there was no particularly clear link between SPLDs and the time, at least in our study with the APTIS test. But what we found was that if you add like a gen, you me measure how long on average uh, it takes for students to read something, let's say on average students read a text for 20 minutes. If you add an extra, 50% to this average, that's um, 10 minutes, then everybody can finish. This is what we found with 120 students. If we read, added 50% to the average time, then everybody finished. So I think with timing, really, I think with the timing of IELTS test, they should reconsider that timing because it disadvantages many students, not just those who have uh, SPLDs. Um, yeah. So hopefully the, some of the testing organizations will be reading our research and responding to that. Okay, um, how can we adapt assessments for students with SPLDs? So um, first of all, um, when you assess, um, um, again, making sure your instructions are clear, they are broken up in, 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 uh, into steps, maybe you're reading out the instructions, so you have recording of instructions as well so that students can listen. Then the other thing you, that you need to consider is how students respond. So if you're assessing reading, um, think about how much students need to write in the um, in the response, um, or can you check, for example, understanding by underlining or true false questions or multiple choice questions, um, so that um, there is not a lot of ri uh, writing required when they respond to the reading task. Then also think about if you are assessing, for example, listening, uh, how much do the students have to read? when, when um, their understanding is being checked. If you have long questions checking their understanding, then it becomes a reading a task and the, and the reading burden uh, for them. So some, you know, think about what are the tasks that still measure what you want to measure, but they do not, you know, disadvantage the students because they have reading challenges or, or writing um, challenges. That's, that's in brief. Um, um, there is a book chapter I wrote about it um, that I can share later um, where you can find uh, more details about it. Um, um, Marcel, English teachers in your country. In Hungary, um, we started a project um, about now 15 years ago. And um, as a result of that project, which was about supporting students with dyslexia, a lot of the initial teacher training uh, courses now in Hungary include some element of, of SPLDs. Um, 
So, um, you know, in most universities. And, and I also teach as a visiting professor, uh, or I used to teach in Vienna. And, uh, and there was, um, there were two units we talked about, um, SBLDs um, there. Um, um, but in many countries, unfortunately, still there is very little on specific learning difficulties and inclusion um, in, um, in, in English language teaching. They talk more about differentiation. And again, differentiation is a very useful technique. Um, and what you learn about differentiation can really be applied well. But um, but unfortunately, a lot of these um, uh, are are these, these areas are neglected in initial teacher education, um, and and in some countries in Europe there are more courses, but not um, not in a lot of them. Right. I, I think we have probably finished the, the questions. Yeah, I think that was the last question. Um, was there anything else you wanted to say before finishing up, Judith? No, just thank you for having me. And I hope you have uh, found the, the presentation useful. And um, you can always um, find uh, me on the internet. You can send me an email. You can join our uh, online course. Or I, I also have a website um, that you can visit for resources. Oh, okay, great. Um, is your website listed on your references on the slides? I, I think so, but I can also put it in the um, in the tweet, in the chat box. Thank you. Um, um, and just while you're doing that, I'd just like to thank you again, Judith, for sharing your expertise and all of your ideas with our Australian English language teaching community this evening. Um, we've all learnt a lot and We've, um, I'm sure, gained a lot of practical techniques that we can use in our classrooms and online to support inclusivity. Um, I personally found it really interesting to hear your views on the opportunities of online teaching to aid inclusivity for students with learning difficulties. Um, so thank you once again, Judith. Well, thank you again. It's been a pleasure and an honour uh, to talk to you and and I hope I will see some of you in real life. <laughs> uh, yes. <sometime. laughs> yeah, it would be great, um, you know, if you could come out to Australia and run a workshop at an English Australia conference or something like that in the future. Yeah. Or the world is a bit more normal. Europe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. And thank you, everyone, for coming along this evening as well. Okay. Thank you. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye.